We are at the top of the hour, so let's begin. Let me welcome everybody. Let me welcome you all to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, I'm the host, and I'm also the chief caterer for the next hour of conversation. Now let me introduce today's program. You know we're in an extraordinary situation where the COVID-19 pandemic continues to roar through societies worldwide, and that has enormous impact on higher education. Now, if you'd like to research that, if you'd like to learn more about it, you simply go to this uh, URL here, just go to tinyurl.com slash covidedu, and I have some resources linked from there, um, including a book, status of higher education in the U.S. and some other countries abroad, as well as links to resources on how to keep up with the virus. And also, one of the things that people have been doing in these conversations is they've been sharing news and information that they get from these conversations. Uh, so for example, uh, here is one campus in the United States where someone learned about a way of using VR that was very inexpensive and already deployed it on their campus. So please ask us questions about practical usage and we're really, really happy to share that. Now, speaking of happy, I want to welcome our three guests. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to have three really extraordinary people here today. Now, who are they and where are they from? Well, uh, two of them are coming to you from the library space. Uh, we have the very, very awesome uh, Lisa Hinchliff, who uh, is, among other things, um, a well-known, widely known figure in the entire library world, including the fields of digital literacy and library policy. And along with her, we have Christine Wolf Eisenberg, uh, who works at Ithaca SNR, who is, among other things, a researcher who just does fantastic work. And the two of them, have been researching how academic libraries have really been responding to COVID-19. And their work gives us, I believe, the best information we have on that. And alongside them, we have the awesome Flower Darby. Uh, Flower is a professor at uh, Northern Arizona University and the author of a really, really nifty book on teaching online, which you'd think would be required reading. Now, speaking of required reading, before I bring them up, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you should see a couple of buttons. Uh, one of them will take you to Flower's book, and the other one will take you to the COVID-19 survey of academic libraries. So, um, before we go any further, let me just grab one of our guests and bring her up on stage. Professor Darby, welcome. Hi, thank you, Brian. Hello to everybody who's made the time to be here today. Thanks for being here. Well, I'm really, really glad that you could make the time. I know you must be enormously in demand, both uh, at your university as well as uh, around the world for your expertise. I'm busy right now. Well, you're busy, but also let me ask, how are you doing? How is uh, the pandemic treating you? How is life in lockdown? In our little corner of the world, I'm, I'm grateful to say that we don't seem to be very affected. We're certainly taking all of our precautions and following guidelines, but um, I'm thankful that so far life here has been relatively stable. I'm very grateful for that. Good, good. Me too. Me too. On your behalf, I'm really, really glad to hear that. Thank you. Uh, now, are you teaching this semester? I'm actually not, no. Um, teaching or working with faculty on their teaching right now. Very good, very good. Well, they really owe you a lot to uh, have you on campus, Hel or I should say, in the institution, helping them uh, with their transition online. Yes. Um, I, have, I have so many questions to ask you. And friends, if you're new to the Future Trends Forum, uh, I'm always, I have tons and tons of questions, but the key thing is your questions. So as I interrogate our poor guests, please think of your own questions, your own comments that you'd like to jump in on, especially as our guests reveal more about their own thinking. Again, just press that raised hand button to tell me that you'd like to join us up here on stage or click you know, the question mark button if you'd like to type in a question or comment. Um, to begin with, uh, Flower, you know so much about how to teach effectively online. I'm just wondering if I could ask you to start off with what are some of the most effective practices that you've been witnessing being used in this fantastic transition that are on the most basic end, the kind of baseline practices? I, I don't mean programming an AI to control your VR helmet. I mean, what are the basic things for the faculty who are just really having the hardest time getting online? Well, Brian, if you know my work, you know I'm all about the simple and the doable um, techniques that we can all employ. And so actually I observed quite a bit of um, struggle with some of those really practical things. And so that's why yesterday the Chronicle printed my latest advice guide on how to teach um, in time-saving and low-tech ways in online instruction. And people who have been teaching online 
uh, understand these approaches, but for folks who have never really thought about how to do this, there are lots of very simple things that you can do that really do help students engage and learn in low bandwidth asynchronous. In other words, they don't have to be there in real time with you mm -hmm. and more, more accessible ways. So uh, posting, it sounds boring, but it works. It's, it's mundane. You can post your static content such as readings or um, short video micro lectures. Um, you can assign students to complete some questions while they're reading a textbook chapter. Some of those very simple um, low hanging fruit things are what I would be encouraging folks to use right now. Very good, very good. Uh, that really, really helps. And that brings up some issues of uh, equity and uh, imbalance. Um, uh, you're thinking more about um, how faculty are making this transition. How do we best support faculty? I'm coming to students and everybody else in a second, but I just want to start off with faculty. I mean, what are the best ways to keep faculty sane and healthy uh, and doing the most effective job in this incredibly difficult environment? A lot of folks, that's a great question. A lot of folks have been um, encouraging us to remind faculty that it doesn't have to be perfect right now, doesn't have to be high tech, um, mm -hmm. that, that we need to be kind to ourselves as faculty, understanding that no one who was teaching in person asked for this situation. And so kindness to ourselves and our students, compassion, and being willing to try something new. So if faculty in the heat of the moment, right around mid-March thought, okay, I'm just gonna move all my classes to Zoom and teach at my same time and day. You know, you might be, I think people are finding that that approach is problematic in many ways. And so the semester's not over yet. We can try something new and be transparent with our students and say, okay, let's, let's, sim let's simplify and see if we can help more people be more successful. How do you uh, help support faculty in that attitude of trying something new? And we, we've had a lot of debate on Twitter and in the blogosphere and on YouTube lately about just how much improvisation, um, just how much creativity should we uh, either expect or try and help uh, happen? Uh, I mean, how, do, how do you get people who are who may be feeling that they want to be defensive and conservative? That's a great question. Again, um, for me, it is, and this might be a hackneyed answer, but it is about reminding faculty that we too can have a growth mindset mm -hmm. about our ability to fail forward and learn from uh, practices that didn't really work the way we expected. And the incredible value of demonstrating that willingness to think again, you know, for our students, that's a life lesson that um, everybody can continue developing. So, for me, it's about empathy, again, for yourself. If something isn't working as in your class, um, give yourself permission to try something new and hmm. be very transparent with your students and say, I don't think this is working very well. Um, encouraging a more open mind instead of a stubborn, we're, we're gonna do this till the end, um, I think can go a long way. Well, that's great, uh, transparency. And uh, I can see why your faculty really, really rely on you. Um, we have a couple of questions that are just bubbling up from the audience. I'm going to flash these up on the screen right now. Uh, to begin with, we have one from uh, Tom Hames in Texas, a wonderful scholar and a great friend of the program, who asks, are you finding that faculty are more willing to deconstruct what they're doing and boiling teaching down to its essence? I think right now faculty are also in survival mode. And I think that this deconstruction and boiling down to the essence will be happening after the close of this semester. I think people are just trying to get through. Um, I, many of the folks that I'm working with are keeping their heads down. They're just trying to get to that finish line and help their students do the same. But I think this um, summer provides an opportunity for some deep reflection about how we could do this better if we're in this situation again. So look ahead to the summer for that. Uh, Tom, great question. and. Uh, Thank you, Flora, for the really good answer. A couple more questions just piled up, and then we have a couple of guests that we want to add to the uh, panel. Uh, one has come from, uh, I believe, Diane uh, Deusterhoff, uh, who asks, what are some of the low-hanging fruit in terms of online pedagogical practices? Could you provide practical examples? Absolutely, Diane, good question, and this is what I do all day long. So low-hanging fruit, again, give your students static content that doesn't require high bandwidth and can be accessed at any time of the day or night that really supports students in uncertain circumstances. Use your learning management systems uh, ass assignment and quiz functions in order to check for student understanding and hold them accountable for their learning. Those tools are accessible 
by nature of being in that system and they're um, relatively easy to learn and use. I'm also a big fan of the online discussion forum. It is low hanging fruit. It can be done effectively. You can have a conversation just as stimulating and robust as the one we're having today with a little bit of um, intention about how you set that up. Here, here. Um, mm -hmm. Diane, that's a great question. And Diane, uh, I fear I mispronounced your name. She's at uh, St. Mary's University. And Flower, thank you for that really, really solid answer. Uh, we have a, a different question that comes from Jessica Surden, uh, who I believe is at Penn State. Uh, and she asks, what surprised you the most when universities began going completely online? That's an awesome question. And really what surprised me the most is how difficult it was for faculty to conceive of how to do this without lecturing during their regular day and time. And, wow. and that, that took me off guard. We literally heard from hundreds, almost thousands of faculty around the world saying, well, all I know is to that I should be teaching in Zoom. What do you mean asynchronous? And so it took me back to my origins about 12 years ago when I first started teaching online. And if I step back a chapter before then, I definitely recall having no idea how you would teach a class you know, online. And so this learning curve this um, aware, this dawning of awareness of, of hopefully a, an opportunity to learn a new skill set and a new way to support our students. Um, that took me off guard at first, but it just reminded me that if, if people haven't had to think about this before, and it is very different, then how would they know? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I remember this during the MOOC days where people hadn't didn't take MOOCs, and so they weren't able to understand them. Right. That's a great question and a really, wow, challenging answer. The lecture just won't die. Uh, we have a couple more comments that are fans of yours, uh, Flower, just to let you know. People are, uh, one really liked your piece this morning in the Chronicle. Uh, and we have one more question from Eric Mystery um, at the College of St. Scholastica, who asks a, a precise question, but one of those technologies. What are some good ways to help increase the quality of online discussion forums? Great question, Eric. And it's it's easier than you think, but it does take some effective planning. So the main takeaway is you need to ask questions that are discussable. You can't ask a really black and white question with no nuance and expect a robust conversation. So ask things with some nuance, with some controversy. I love to ask students to apply the course content and concepts to their own experience. It really helps them process material in different ways. I also like to provide three or four different discussion questions per forum that students can then choose to engage in according to their own interest. And meanwhile, other students can learn from what the group talking about that question is, is discussing. So there are definitely some ways to add complexity. For me, a really big takeaway is to think about what happens in a good in-person discussion or conversation like we're having today and to structure your questions and your facilitation as if it were an organic conversation with lots of guidance, facilitation, uh, questions, clarif clarifications, those sure. kinds of things. So if for the faculty members who are thinking, I need to lecture, I need to lecture, I need to lecture, they're saying, well, you need to discuss, you need to help discussions matter, and we can use that discussion board to do that very thing. That's right. Well, fantastic question. Um, I said, okay, we're done. We're ready to go. No, we have so much. <laughs> uh, so, and let, let me just, if I can, uh, bring in the library world uh, to add to our teaching and learning focus. Uh, Lisa, I'm so glad to see you here. Thanks. Welcome. It's great to be here. How is everything in quarantine? In, uh, in, you're, you're in Illinois, right? Right. So we are... Um, we are sheltering in place. I like to keep separate the quarantine. Obviously, quarantine is very important for people who do know they've been exposed or who are sick. Um, but I am fortunate, um, sheltering in place, um, and I'm really grateful to our governor, who I think is providing really good leadership, especially for someone who works for the state um, at the University of Illinois. But um, I've um, been personally quite impressed. Um, those of you who know our last election, we had our choice between two billionaires and yeah. um, apparently, you know, so it's interesting because, <laughs> um, so we, we have Pritzker, Governor Pritzker, and as many people have said, we didn't didn't know this is what we would see, but we're very, very pleased to see it, so. It's been a long time since we had good news about Illinois politics. Well, you know, Illinois politics is just the gift that keeps giving. Yes, like a comic opera. Yes, um, exactly. 
I heard that Governor Pritzker was interested in organizing a coalition of Midwestern states. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think he's um, certainly stepped forward in in many ways. And I mean, Chicago is obviously a really major a major city for the U.S., right, with also being um, internationally important as well as crossroads of a lot of um, a lot of commerce, honestly. So there's a there's a lot going on. Um, but so we are. You know, he's giving da daily briefings, actually, that I've encouraged other people in other states to listen to just because I feel like they're so informative and um, with a real leadership perspective. So, well, thank you. What time is this? You know, I don't know. They just pop up on Facebook Live for me. So, um, but they're recorded, of course, as well. And, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I, I think I should stop talking about politics at this point before I, I veer too far. Um, probably the other interesting thing is I've learned to do some basic plumbing at our house, so who knew? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad for your learning. I'm, I'm yes. for <laughs> I, I swear owning a home is all about water being where it's not supposed to be or water not being where it's supposed to be. It feels like 90% of the task of home water, ownership. Water is the great enemy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, so. of cities, uh, let me introduce your uh, colleague. Yeah, Christine. Christine Wolf Eisenberg. Hello, hello. Hi, Brian. Thanks for oh. having having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's great to have you back. Listen, how is everything for you under lockdown? Uh, I am personally well and safe and and healthy. Um, I work out of. Uh, I normally work out of an office in Manhattan. I am in uh, my apartment in New Jersey. Um, our uh, our governor has just stated that schools are to stay K twelve schools are to stay closed through um, May fifteenth at this point. That was just announced today. But um, yeah, just just you know, on a personal level, staying staying in my apartment. No no plumbing plumbing dilemmas or issues to take care of. So I'm uh you know I'm I'm hanging in there. Well, good. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad you're safe. Um... Listen, uh, I, I love to ask people to uh, talk about and introduce themselves by describing what they're working on for the next year. But our situation now is so extraordinary that the next year is mind blowing to think about and we're really focused on the next few days. Um, if I could ask the two of you, Lisa and Christine, why don't you introduce uh, your fantastic research project, your spreadsheet looking at what's going on with academic libraries. We've been talking with Flower Darby about what's going on with academic teaching. Tell us what's going on with the libraries on campuses. So um, let, maybe I'll do just a little bit of background on the survey and what we're collecting, and then I'll uh, turn it over to Christine to share about some of the findings. <clears throat> so um, inspired, Brian, by your Google Doc that you had started on what was happening with campus closure and Christine's work there um, March 11th, feel so yesterday, um, Christine tweeted out, hey, is anyone capturing what's happening with libraries? And I said, hey, I looked for that yesterday and we jumped on a phone call actually and um, said we, you know, we should do something. And um, at first, Christine, I'm gonna call her out for this. She's like, I think we could have something done by Monday. And I was like, no, it has to be done by tonight. We have to have it out tonight. <laughs> and um, so, and we did, 10 hours later we had, um, gone to the literature, developed survey questions, field tested them with some cognitive interviews, programmed it in the platform, did some pre-testing walkthroughs. We really have to give a shout out to the whole academic library community because we were you know, on Twitter at one o'clock, hey, who can test this for me in the next hour? And like 26 people walk through it within you know, 30 minutes or something. Um, so we were able to get it out in the field um, on March 11th. We've been collecting since then. It's a very basic, straightforward survey. Um, we did embed the iPads um, indicator in it, and librarians are great because they understand metadata, so everyone goes and gets their iPads code and puts it in. We designed it as well. Um, it captures what's happening with instruction, what's happening with whether students are still in residence, um, as, and then has a series of questions about what is happening with the library with respect to both the building, the physical collections, a number of services, whether remote work is being allowed, um, and some other open-ended things. We also designed it so that libraries could take it repeatedly. So it, um, we have 
you know, before and after and during. We have at least a couple of libraries who have filled it out six times as their policies have changed over the course oh, of the month. Oh, God, so God. we have some so we have some great data on any given moment in time, but we also have the ability to see how things have changed over time. And so with that, maybe I'll let Christine do the the second part, which is so what what have we found? And um, I see you did put the URL in there, Brian, because the other oh I have to say it's one other thing, Christine. Sorry. Um, we designed it so that as soon as somebody answered the survey, it went onto a live dashboard where people could see the results. So we had a reporting happening as soon as the very first library filled it out, which by the way happened in like seven minutes or something. So um, this is real time data that everyone can get to at any point in time. It's not like we're collecting it and we'll report it back later. So Christine. Yeah, no, that was a that was a great uh, intro piece because I just hit refresh on the dashboard myself to see how many what right. our what our latest figures are. So we, um, you know, through through kind of uh, organic outreach, um, we've been able to capture responses from from 841 institutions across the U.S. Oh, thus far, which is uh really uh you know lisa i don't know what you expected at the beginning of this i i could not have expected this i mean i don't think we knew what to expect but um and it it is um and and people have been as, as lisa said people have been really generous we have 584 logged updates now some of those do represent colleges coming back or libraries coming back you know multiple times to to report updates but many 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 are coming are coming back to provide updates which allows us to not just you know get get results you know at a single point in time but we can can track along a long time and a lot a lot has changed so lisa and i have done analyses um with the first 24 hours of responses when they came in, the next 48 hours of responses, the first two weeks or so of responses. So we've really been been tracking this as it's been been evolving. And so as the community, as Lisa said, you know, the results are out there. People are actively using it for for decision making and and for advocacy, um, primarily to to advocate for for closing physical library locations. So. I'll just mention a couple a couple of the things that that we've we've found. Um, so the the first is really that um, campus practices and and policies are really waterfalling to the library. So we are seeing you know a certain change happen at the institution, and then it might take a couple of days or it might take a week for the library in turn to make to make some kind of a change to their policies or or building hours. Um, and so speaking of of building hours. What's great about the the data collection happening over time is we can really map out at a given point in time where most libraries totally open, and that happened in the first two days, three days of data collection um, in early mid uh, mid March. Then they had you know partial openings for about a week, and then and then it really trended towards being being closed, um, which which means that access to physical collections is uh, limited or non-existent um, at this at this point. Um, there's been a really huge expansion of, of um, shifting to digital reference and, and instruction for information literacy classes. Um, a lot of remote work happening now, as as is the case across higher ed that was never really, really happening before. A lot of policy changes around that as well. So maybe that's that's where I'll leave it. That's kind of the the landscape high level overview of what we've been what we've been finding so far. Well that's fantastic. What a rich trove. Uh, I mean that's a lot of libraries. Um, and at least you say up to six changes in one month for each library. So we we did have a couple survey so this was at the 10 day mark. Um, which is the last time we pulled all the data. And by the way, all of these analyses that Christine mentioned are also on that portal page that we created at the tiny URL slash COVID library. Um, at that point, we saw a few libraries that had actually submitted six times. So because the survey can be done as many times as you want, some places are really doing this amazing job for us of like, we changed this policy, so we'll report in. We changed this policy. It was more common that we saw one update or two updates um, as opposed to five or six. <laughs> the other thing about this survey, the way it's designed, um, 
this survey can actually continue to be taken as libraries reopen mm. at whatever point that is. Let's we mm. have hope that at some point we're going to reopen. Yeah. The way it's designed right now, even if people started reopening, they can mm. still take the survey and can, and so we may add some questions over time. That's possible, but at the moment, the survey would still completely work if all you were doing was just swinging back into being open. So a question we get a lot is how long are you going to leave this open? And we just don't know, like until it's not useful anymore, but at the moment it still feels like it's yeah. useful. And, and this will be a great historical document. I'm uh, looking forward. Yeah. Uh, we need a quick question from uh, Jordana Shaw from Middlesex Community College who asked, what is the URL? If you look on the bottom left corner of your screen, you'll see two uh, kind of tan or uh, brown colored buttons. Uh, the top one is Academic Library Response. Just click that and you'll pop right into the Google Doc. And right below that is a link to Small Teaching Online, Flowers book about teaching online. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm telling you this knowing that you both will be so interesting that you'll leave the conversation. It's a risk because they're both such great <laughs> Uh, we have a, another question uh, that I want to put up on stage, and then we have a uh, uh, then we have a video guest. Um, this is from uh, Gretchen Awithyun, uh, one of your Ithaca colleagues, uh, who asks, "Do you find that most faculty are asking librarians for help in this transition, or are they working through the issues on their own? And what is your best, most effective outreach method to reach faculty?" And I'm wondering, Flower, could you start us off with this because you're seeing this right at the front at the cold phase. So we had the greatest um, turnout in literally years for support from faculty, but um, many more faculty are figuring this out on their own. And I do think it's a faculty mindset that um, that's what we do when we're, when we're given a class to teach, we figure it out. Uh, I hope that this opportunity invites faculty to take advantage of support folks like librarians and instructional designers in terms of ways that we can support them that they, of course, might not even know about if they haven't come to us before. Well, thank you. Lots of DIY going on. Yeah, I, that's my sense. So I can say, um, Brian, this isn't necessarily something we really sought to capture in the survey, which was more about operations, but I myself, being the coordinator for information literacy at the University of the Library, the University of Illinois, work closely with our Center for Teaching and Learning, and I am on one of our many keep teaching teams, um, which were put into place to support this. Um, our library has also put into place uh, a really expedited uh, licensing and purchasing process for anything that is needed for courses. Mm -hmm. um, so I was actually just on a, a phone a meeting, phone call this morning um, with our user services team, which is where I report. And we're already thinking ahead and starting to acquire things for people for summer and thinking ahead to fall. Because we, um, even if faculty are back in the classroom, everyone will teach differently because of this experience. And so we're already seeing people sort of thinking about these pedagogies that they've developed and starting to having then experience them seeing that maybe there's some things that they'll even want to do differently if they are physically back in the classroom, although they won't be this summer, we already know that. So, I mean, I can say that we are very busy um, locating materials for faculty, um, I, kind of like a, this, I saw Emily Drabinsky put on Twitter yesterday. She said, we have an ebook detective service um, because librarians just are very good at sort of searching out where could this ebook be? Where might it be? Who could yes. we license it from? Yeah. Maybe you can't get it from the publisher, but it's from one of our platform providers. So, I mean, we're seeing faculty um, look for those resources, not so much. So for us, it's more assistance with, with content. Um, Thank you. I a quick shout out, if I could, to Georgetown University librarians who've been helping mm -hmm. find ebooks all over the place. So, mm -hmm. uh, Christine. Yeah. So I guess I'll I'll, I'll maybe say th two things. One one is kind of echoing back to something that Flower was saying earlier, and and also built off of what Lisa was just saying, which is that I think I think right now everyone's just trying to scramble to do the best the best they can. So I think. Um, you know, the time for for reflection and additional support certainly, you know, is is now, but also also is going to happen in the in the month to come. I think everyone's just trying to 
get by with what they what they can what they can do right now. Um, the the other thing that I've been hearing from a lot of um, from a lot of uh, uh, library leaders, library practitioners that we've been talking to is around um, a lot. A lot of publishers are opening up a lot of content right now um, that was was never available previously. And so what I'm what I'm hearing often is that you know there's a there's a challenge in that, which is that you don't necessarily want to refer um, refer faculty or even students to that resource necessarily without the kind of explanation around its availability past you know the middle the middle of this year so that 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 presents its own kind of challenge there's this great opportunity with more content perhaps out there than ever than ever before um, but what's kind of the, the mediating role of the of the librarian in, in explaining what that access is going to look like long term and the effects that that's going to have on on library acquisition budgets mm -hmm. That's a really great point. As usual, open is a complicated mm -hmm. term. It, it, yeah, yeah. Uh, we thank you, uh, all three of you, uh, for a really, really rich trio of answers yeah, to a great like question. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. 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 Mikyun, if I mispronounced your name. Um, huh? Now I'd like to bring on the stage um, a reference librarian from Franklin Pierce University. But to do this, we've hit the limit of how many people can be on stage at one time. So this is a library question. Flower, I'm just going to take you down for a minute, bring uh, Katie Beth Ryan up, and bring you right back. We'll swap. We'll take her. Hold on for one minute. Um, let's see. We have Katie Beth Ryan. I'm sorry, Flower. I really didn't mean didn't mean to bump you off. <laughs> That's not the way welcome. I wanted to introduce myself. No, welcome. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing as well as I can, given the circumstances, you know, just doing the best as, as, as everyone here is, is doing. So good. Good. So my question actually, it, it's somewhat related to Gretchen's. Um, uh, we're a really small library staff for a small, you know, undergraduate in-person focused university. We've yeah. made ourselves as available as we can uh, via chat reference, via email, getting the word out to people about through our, our um, campus-wide app, social media, et cetera. And I haven't run figures, but we're not seeing a lot of, um, a lot of traction, especially on chat reference. We've really tried to make ourselves available on chat reference. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're kind of scratching our heads. Think we were thinking this would be, you know, more heavily used. Um, but I, I'm just wondering if, if if you all have ideas for maybe what either what we could be doing differently or how else we can demonstrate our our value to the faculty during this time because we want we we we, we keep you know driving home the point that we're a resource and we want to be there for them. Can I ask a quick question? Is sure. chat reference something that you started for this pandemic, no, or did you? No, start it no, no. Chat reference is not new for us. Okay. Like, I don't. I, I've only been at Franklin Pierce about six months, so yeah. I don't know how long we've had it, but it's been kind of a mainstay in That's our okay. our, our reference. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think one of the things I would reflect upon, um, which is a little bit of what Flower said. So, <laughs> sorry, we lost her here for a second, but. Um, you know, I think we also need to recognize that what students need the library for is dependent upon what they're expected to do in their classes. And as faculty are adjusting, and in many cases, um, removing certain assignments, um, those may be the assignments that would have required library use. And so one of the things we're missing right now is we don't really know what's happening inside the classroom, except anecdotally. Mm. So, um, it, you know, so we just, we don't have a good sense of that, right? Of like, has every research paper just been dropped and instead people are writing more of an exegesis on a course text, right? So rather than expecting students to go out and gather up materials, they're just doing a more um, close reading, say for example, of a particular text that was already assigned. So it may be the students are still doing writing, but they're not doing research-based writing. So I think that's one of the things that's a little difficult for us right now. I think the other thing is, you know, without a doubt for students, if we actually looked at the proportion of students in the building at any given point in time, I was head of the undergraduate library at Illinois for a couple years, you know, there'd be 700 students in the building 
and you know we'd get 20 questions that were research questions right so purport, so one of the things that's difficult is is really getting that sense of like what should your traffic be if you and and so many of those questions were also driven i think by opportunity like we were just right there Right, so how do you develop presence, I think is the real question for us. So we have digital services, but I don't think we always have digital presence. So in the library, in the, in the physical world, the way we had presence was quite literal, right? They walked right by us to get to their study room or what have you. So what's the equivalent of that digitally? And I think one of the challenges is we don't have virtual student unions, we don't have, the virtual study spaces. Um, I saw somebody put up this idea, which I think is a really fantastic idea because they, this, they were thinking like maybe they would create like zo use Zoom or something and basically have a library space and then people could go study in small groups within the Zoom rooms. This is like not the most natural use of Zoom, but it was this idea that you would still come to a place and this would be your study time. And I thought that was an interesting sort of recreation. That's not asking us questions, but it's our it, that's our community cultivation role in the library um, that I think we could think about. What does community cultivation look like online in the outside of the classroom, but academically focused way? And I think this is an interesting challenge for us in this time that we could potentially do some interesting things with. Wow, that's a great answer. <laughs> Um, thank you, Katie. Uh, I think we just lost your sound. Um, it's okay. I think you're muted. Yes, we lost your sound. <laughs> but it's okay. It's you're okay. not wearing a, a mask, so I could read your lips. You're welcome. I think you said thank you. <laughs> thank you. That was a fantastic question. And in the meantime, uh, please stay safe. Um, so let me uh, uh, let me bring up um, and go back to uh, our our uh, previous configuration. Uh, let me uh, bring uh, Flower back on stage because we have a question for all of you. Um, and I want to make sure that we get a chance, uh, all of you get a chance to wrangle this one. Um, so the question has to do um, with uh, where, oh, excuse me, there you are. Um, the question has to do with um, other groups on campus. And this is Eileen Daly Boas uh, coming from the University of Rochester. Uh, and she asks, there are lots of other groups, <laughs> excellence in teaching, librarians, uh, who are more who are trying to help with TAs, workshop leaders, et cetera, it's challenging. It's more than just faculty. Uh, any advice, and I, I think she means, you know, any advice for, for helping support all these groups in, in doing this work? Eileen, if I'm wrong, please uh, follow up. I think for me, um, what I've seen is that this is an opportunity for folks who aren't used to doing online support uh, or online um, professional development opportunities. I think this is this is a time that Centers for Teaching and Learning can embrace and, and take this opportunity to learn how better to facilitate faculty learning in online environments. Um, I'm not sure what librarians, how, how you would answer, Lisa, Christine. I guess maybe maybe I'll answer from from uh, not not a library representative because I you know am am not really one um, but from from an outside research perspective and um, you know we've had this this interesting challenge this semester in in the work that that um, I lead with with my team which is what are we going to do with all of our our data collection processes. Our, our projects where we're partnering with academic libraries to collect information on how students are going about learning, what their, what their assignments look like, how faculty are teaching and performing research. And we've had to suspend all of all of that research right now. There isn't, there isn't a lot of research that's being um, allowed to be done in that kind of way in terms of survey research by individual parts of the institution. And so, so what we've done in an effort to kind of bring together um, a lot of 
different disparate parts of the institution is to field institution-wide surveys in partnership with the Institutional Research Office or perhaps the Provost Office to gather information. I mean, Lisa, to what you were just saying, we don't we don't know necessarily what's going on in the classroom and how faculty are adjusting their their assignments right now. Um, and that's not just important for the library to know or for the Center for Teaching and Learning to know or for a third group to know. It's it's really something that needs to be to to be shared out really broadly. And so so we've been offering, um, you know, for example, a, a student survey for institutions to field that hit on very particular topics right now. How are institutional communications going? What are you being assigned? What resources are you using to do that? How are you doing in terms of your, you know, general wellness, and and are you likely to return next semester? And we have some plans to to roll out something similar for um, for faculty as well. So I, I I guess what I would what I would say is that you know it's not necessarily a time to be doing um you know individual activities. It's a time to to come together and look across different units and figure out um, how best to to support faculty and and students at this time uh, more uh, more more collectively. We actually, we, we have a, a question that came in from a different person that actually, I think, connects directly to this. And I'll put it on the table so you can see this. Uh, this is from Charles Finley at Northeastern who asks, what's happening with e-access to content for remote learners who are completing final projects? Uh, so, I mean, if we're talking about remote access to content resources that are not openly available, as I presume the context there, because if they're openly available, um, but yeah. But I, one thing I do want to sort of just like inelegantly insert into this um, <laughs> conversation is um, something I think Christine's survey is going to help institutions get at, but I think we also do not have a sense. We had a good sense of what students' computing access and their access to technology was on campuses, in part because our investments in libraries and in other places leveled that up. I think that our students, even at the best institutions with you know lots of on-campus resources, are experiencing an incredible digital divide um, within any given classroom. And I was talking to a student who um, is a physics major at our institution, and you know she's left the campus per the residential requirements. She's from a rural farming community. Um, they do not have internet access where she lives. She is trying to finish her 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 undergraduate major in physics on her phone with two bars of data. Um, we got an email from our vice president about the use of um, Proctor, Ute, Proctor, Proctorio or whatever, that testing software in which she said, we now realize that five to 10% of our students do not have technology that can, that, that can support using this in the classroom. You need to make other arrangements. Unfortunately, like I think as a faculty member, like you need to make other arrangements is kind of a lot to just <laughs> you know. So like there's a real digital divide here that I think we need to, really face up to. Um, so what's happening with e-access? I mean, libraries have long developed ways for people to get through proxy servers and the like, but all of these systems are straining under remote access. Um, our campus VPN has a message that pops up. It did, at least maybe they fixed it now, but it basically said, please don't use the VPN unless you have to, <laughs> because like it's so strained. Why we saw publishers that made some content freely available. Cambridge University Press put out some content freely available and they had to put the paywall back up because the demand that suddenly started hitting their servers Ooh. meant that even people who were paying for the content weren't able to get to it. So the flip side of this, I think, is that faculty really have to um, adjust their expectations to the access that their students have. And um, yes, maybe the assignment was going to presume you were going to be able to get into the rare book room and examine that 14th century manuscript or what I make it that 17th century, whatever. They can't do that now. That is not a student failure. And so those assignments need adjusting. So there's just this huge range that students are experiencing between faculty who are, you know, adjusting and, and really cognizant of these things. And then other faculty who are sort of like, this is the syllabus. And I, I do hope that what Christine talked about with some institutional attention to this, we can sort of 
address, I mean, just obviously this digital divide has just got me obsessed right now, but I'm, I'm so concerned the students who are already disadvantaged by certain policies we're putting in place around testing, proctoring, et cetera, you know, they, they, this education was their lifeline and now we're like making it impossible for them to get that education. So I obviously went really far to the right of a, Chuck's question, but like. But not to, <laughs> uh, Chuck, that's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, or Charles, because I don't know you well enough to call. Oh, you. I'm sorry, Charles. Um, but uh, but Lisa, thank you. Um, that went in all kinds of great directions. Um, I, I really appreciate it. And this circles back, I think, as well uh, to uh, Flower to your points when you opened our hour by talking about uh, using asynchronous and uh, more basic technologies in teaching. Um, we have a question uh, from the West Coast uh, for all of you, um, which I want to put on the board, and this is a little daunting. Um, this comes from uh, Mark Dahl uh, at Lewis and Clark, who asks, here's an area to survey, staffing changes. Academic libraries are be mm -hmm. begin to face furloughs and layoffs as this goes on. And I want to put this to all of you in part because I think uh, Mark's question is a good one for your, for your research. Um, and when he says changes, that probably doesn't mean expanding uh, new uh, lines or new hires. Um, so, I mean, Christine and, and Lisa, I, I would love to hear what some of you are you're hearing about this. Then also, Flower, I'd like to come back to you to ask you about this and what you're thinking about in terms of general faculty uh, staffing changes, including the faculty and staff who teach in all these different areas, including teaching and learning centers and writing centers. So if, if we could start off with uh, Lisa and Christine uh, first, what do you see in the library space? So, so I'll I'll jump in, and I think Lisa probably already knows mm -hmm. knows where I'm where I'm going with this. So we um, every every three years we at the guest and our conduct a national survey of of library deans and directors, and we did that in fall 2019. We did not expect that um, you know the world was going to look like what it does now. Um, and so the the usefulness of that, or or the ways that we can use th those data, have have really changed. Um, we released our report um, earlier this month of what those findings were, and I think they give us they give us some sense. Um, of of um, the intention of libraries, they give us the the most comprehensive data set really on on where academic libraries at at four year institutions intended to go before before all of this. So when it comes to when it comes to staffing, we see we see a big shift away from staffing to support collections and towards supporting services. For example, we see greater investment in electronic resources over over print resources, as one might expect. And so, um, you know, we we expect that that some of those changes that I just mentioned that we've observed since the prior survey three years three years ago. Many of those will will probably accelerate, um, and I know a lot of a lot of libraries are being faced with um, real or or anticipated they they will be real um, budget cuts in the in the current month or months to come as we enter another another fiscal year, um, and I I think we will probably see greater investment in in digital and in in services to support research, teaching, and learning, um, not necessarily towards. Um, towards collections and especially not towards towards print collections, of course, while those are are inaccessible. So um, we we will be fielding another um, another survey of library directors later this year to capture what has changed, even just between um, last fall when we did the the last survey and um, probably a couple of months from now to see to see what has changed and and staffing staffing will will change and 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 some some libraries may pursue um you know strategies of of making changes across the board some may make very deliberate changes to ramp up areas where perhaps they they already had intended to make greater investment and and now is the time when there isn't an option to do to do otherwise so i'll i'll you know can't predict the future but maybe i'll leave it at that and I'll just share that I'm seeing this, Brian, from a very particular vantage point that I'll share personally, which is we have a School of Information Sciences here at the University right. of Illinois. So yeah. I have all of these um, students that I work with who are graduating with their library science master's degree oh. in May. And yeah. they were on the job market, especially the ones I work with are looking to go into academics. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I have a weekly coffee hour with Lisa 
with my the grad students that I work with in any number of capacities. We just all get online together on Thursday morning. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it's about the job hunt right now. And honestly, it's rather depressing. Um, many of them have had almost every application that they had out, have received notice that the search has been canceled um, or it's been indefinitely postponed. Um, there has been a couple rays of sunshine. Um, one student did actually interview for a job, a all day Zoom hint, maybe break those over a couple days for the candidates people. But um, she was offered the job and is, you know, will be going off to a professional position. But I think that's going to be the rare story and more likely is the story of, of, of the people who are saying, um, I can't even get an interview because there's not even jobs to apply for or everything I applied for has been closed. So it's it's a really difficult time, um, you know, from that market. And I think it's it's not going to be easier for a while. I, I think also just to just to piggyback on that for one second, I, I think what we're hearing from from some leaders within academic libraries is that perhaps the best case scenario out of this is a hiring freeze like, you know, that 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 would be a relatively good outcome Um, and that a lot of a lot of searches where they were ready to extend a job offer um, and had a really great pool of candidates that's you know been been cut off at this point well flower do you want to (laughs) add the picture and cheer us up or is it just going to get worse Well, really quickly, I have one perspective to share. Certainly, this is a heavy question and a heavy future that we're looking into. But I also think this is an opportunity for academic leaders to expand support services for remote and online teaching for better quality online teaching. Mm. And so I, I believe that teaching and learning centers and instructional design folks are oftentimes not really resourced in the way that where they can make a meaningful impact or that uh, processes at institutions don't meaningfully embed these support folks. And so I, I, um, although it's a challenging thing to say when we're looking at such financial difficulty, I do believe the time is right to invest more in support folks who can um, make this teaching and learning experience and research experience um, better, more effective. Well, um, I, I agree. And I, I share all your, the three of you, I share your, your concerns. Um, and I applaud your answers. Your sanguine um, data back answers. And I thank Mark um, for the really, really excellent question. Yeah. Um, we have time for one more question before we completely run out of time. Uh, and uh, this is a, a mental health question. It comes from one a, a mindfulness educator, the awesome Roxanne Riskin, uh, who is a longtime friend and supporter of the program, who we love very much. And she asks, how are you, and this is for all three of you, librarians, library professionals, uh, dealing with stress and anxiety? And what services are you seeing students ask for to help with stress? So, I mean, I think, it, you know, a lot of our organizations are doing very similar things. So we, my organizations had a number of sort of like all, all staff drop-ins with the Dean kind of thing. I mentioned that um, for my own sort of group of graduate students that I work with, either they're taking classes from me or they work for me or what have you. We have this weekly coffee hour. Um, But I don't necessarily know that we have seen, um, I think typically libraries had developed their um, sort of study and stress support services in partnership with counseling centers on campus. And so librarians weren't necessarily themselves delivering that kind of support so much as we were delivering it. We were we were partnering with um, the Campus Wellness Center or the like to bring their services into our spaces. I suspect at the moment that that's just like those sorts of things have just sort of like no one's ready to figure out how you collaboratively build programs online because everyone's just kind of like, how do we just keep everything functioning at the moment? If we go longer than summer in this mind, then I expect we'll start seeing ourselves turn to more of these like actual intentional programming um, of, of sort of programs that we would have had in person. But at this point, I think those are, um, you know, those have been kind of left to the campus wellness center, the counseling center, which have had the extra challenge, of course, that their services need um, even more privacy kinds of protections around them than even library services do. So I know on my campus, there's a lot of work to 
to, and in other communities to build that up. Well, this goes back to Eileen uh, Daily Boss's question earlier, but these other groups on campus, and now we add to it the mm -hmm. Columbus Center and so on. Uh, Christine, you have this fantastic vantage point from Mythic SNR. What, what are you seeing? Yeah, so I mean, on a on a on a personal level, and and speaking of my my organization, it's it's really good to have meaningful work to do right now. I'm really glad to have a my plate very full of of um, mm -hmm. projects where I feel like we can really contribute to the community. That that makes that that really works for for me. Um, our organizational leadership is really emphasizing a lot of care in their communications. So, you know, telling staff very clearly that their health and their families and their wellness comes comes first. Um, some some staff are um, organizing Monday and Thursday lunches to kind of simulate what it's like to be in the office together. And anyone can can pop in and get split out into a Zoom room where they'll have a group of about four to six people to just just chat with. Um, otherwise, there aren't a lot of opportunities to just catch up in the way that you might at the the water cooler or getting getting coffee or eating lunch. Um, I think um, you know. I'll just just say one one quick thing about supports for students. So yeah, the the kinds of supports that libraries have built out um, digitally have been to date probably much more robust than other support services on campus. And I will not be surprised. I mean, we're starting to get some preliminary survey data from the institutions that are fielding our, our kind of emergency response survey right now. I will not be surprised if we continue to see um, students having relatively much higher concern over their mental health as opposed to, to their physical health right now. Um, and so, you know, certainly a time to, to be thinking about how to, how to make those services more robust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. And my best to my friends at Ethic Gas and More. Uh, Thanks, Fred. Flower, what are you, what are you seeing? I, I know you've got some great advice for people, too. Um, well, <laughs> thanks for that uh, vote of confidence, Brian. Mostly, <laughs> I was going to say that I like what Lisa said about planning better for the fall, because I don't think students especially are receiving um, effective support right now. And in terms of those of us who are trying to help um, classes complete successfully. I think we're all doing the best we can. And the best, most support that I have found personally is when people post things about it's okay if your brain isn't really working as well as it normally does. And it's okay if you have fuzzy pandemic brain or um, like Aisha Ahmad last week on the Chronicles forum talking about um, we need to give ourselves permission to only do low hanging fruit tasks. And for me, that's been the greatest source of comfort, but I don't think anybody is really managing this um, quite as well as could be. I, I do give credit to everybody who's doing everything we can in this situation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roxanne, thank you for a great question from the heart. And thanks to all three of you for your answers. But we are out of time. So I need to thank all of you for your answers and discussion throughout this hour. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And, and, and my thanks to the wonderful flow of questions from all over the place. Uh, let, me just, let me just ask each of you really, really quickly, What's the best way for all of our listeners and viewers to keep up with each of you? Flower? I'm pretty active on Twitter at Flower Darby. Can't miss that. Uh, Christine? Same same thing. It's uh, C. Wolf Eisenberg, first initial, last last name without the hyphen. Very, very good. And, and uh, Lisa Librarian on Twitter. <laughs> and we'll follow these, follow these tweets, everybody. And uh, let me thank each of you uh, so much. I need to uh, um, right now uh, just show you just a quick note about uh, where we're going next week. But I do want to thank everybody for the uh, really wonderful uh, string of questions uh, that we've had. Um, just to uh, point out, uh, moving ahead, uh, tomorrow from 2 to 3, uh, I'm working the Chronicle of Higher Education on a uh, event about fixing higher education's inequalities in a time of crisis. Uh, Sarah Goldrick Rab, who was a fantastic Future Transform guest, will be there along with some other folks. Um, now, next week, uh, we're going to continue our focus on coronavirus. So please watch your Twitter feed or your email uh, for a detailed description of next week's program. Uh, if you want to keep talking about this, if you want to keep bashing on these ideas of mental health and uh, layoffs and how to keep access to e-resources, we have all these venues available for our Facebook group, our uh, Twitter hashtag and our LinkedIn group and our Slack channel. Uh, if you'd like to go back in time and look at our previous sessions on COVID-19, if you'd like to look at our previous sessions on libraries or e-resources, just head to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. 
Um, I've been adding a whole bunch of uh, recordings up there lately, so it's a pretty rich thing to go. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, from all of us at the forum, please stay safe. Um, avoid infecting others. Don't get infected. Please, please be well. Um, we love you all, and make sure that you're in good shape. Uh, we'll see you online, and we'll see you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.